On this episode of DL and Extend, we discuss the available Linux-based smartphone options. This episode of DL and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitward. Welcome to episode 49 of DL and Extend. DL and Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the DL and community from places like the DL and Discourse forums, Telegram groups, Discord servers, and more. We also take topics from other shows around the network and give our takes. And with me this week, as always, most of the time, is the person with the totally unhealthy obsession with OpenSUSE, Nate. Almost. It- Totally unhealthy. And <laughs> we have the photographer extraordinaire, Wendy. What's going on, guys? Good so, things. <laughs> Spring is approaching. Spring means green. Green means open SUSE. So everything is good. <laughs> almost, almost unhealthy. Yeah, totally. Totally almost unhealthy. <laughs> Note the sarcasm. Anyway, so uh, Wendy, what have you been up to? Yesterday, I took the kids shoe shopping. All four kids needed shoes at the exact same time. And do you know how fun it is to take four kids into a shoe store and get all four of them shoes? It's an adventure, to say the least. And I'm very proud of my boys. They did quite good on this trip. But now that they all have new shoes, I feel quite robbed. Light in the pocketbook. (laughs) Yes, for sure. (laughs) I'm I'm impressed. You took all your well, you said four kids with you. Yep. Now just taking one kid shopping with me is is an adventure. I I can't imagine how taking four, especially doing something that sounds just that, absolutely miserable. Shoe shopping. It is. It absolutely is. I don't like taking them grocery shopping either, just because. Yeah, there's more to do, right? I'm already. I'm not a very big fan of people. I like some people and I like being around a few people, but I very much just like, okay, most stores, let alone the grocery store, which is typically full of people and people standing in the way and people not putting their carts back. And it just makes me all irritated. <laughs> <laughs> so taking taking four kids to the grocery store is typically not the most fun, but I don't get a chance to go big store shopping anymore without the kids. Because we're already in big town twice a week with the two different co-ops that we participate in. I knew everybody needed shoes. I know they needed shoes for a while. And I've been dragging my feet just because I didn't want to take everybody in at the same time. Because you typically have to help one child at a time make sure that they're finding the right size. And they're meeting some of mom's specific needs of A, are they completely covering your foot? And B, do they have enough traction that the stuff that we do outdoors as a family, they're safe for? So it's each one kid at a time. And then the other three have nothing to do. Sure they do. I took the advantage of technology at this point. And I gave them my phone and said, start a show. And how'd that go? Fantastic. They were quiet. They were so quiet that the one sales gal that was helping us didn't even know that my boys were there. So, Nate, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been playing a lot with uh, Plasma 5.21, and kind of comparing it between... Uh, so, on Tumbleweed, it has 5.21.2 uh, right now. Dot three should be coming out soon. Whenever it's been properly uh, checked and quality assurance eyesed in the uh, in the Tumbleweed world. I was just kind of noticing some of the, the enhancements, some of the changes that they made. And I've really, uh, I, I really enjoy the different improvements here and there and everywhere. I know this is kind of old news now. It's been out for a little while. It's just, they're all just like little things, but, but like making the menu so it's not that awful kickoff menu anymore. In my opinion, it's been pretty huge as far as things that I, I like. It's a nice menu. I don't know. For me, that was a little bit jarring at first the, the, when the menu that I'd had for so long was all of a sudden different. Different. I, you can get the old one still if yeah. you want. But I think the new one just has a better feel to it. I still don't like it because you can't increase the size of it. You know, because I don't like scrolling through my applications if I'm looking for something. If I'm look, you know, I'm just taking a quick glance. So, I mean, outside of that, I mean, but I think it's nice. I still use just the application menu, just a very simple, you know, circa window. 95 ish looking pop up menu. It's, it's just, it's nice and fast for me. Yeah. The system monitor, I really like the system monitor. They've done like a total overhaul on that. It has different, you know, the memory, uh, like these different, like, like, like pie chart, not pie charts, but they're, you know, these, these graphs, these circular graphs that show how much memory you're using and, and so forth and your CPU usage and, and, and the like, your disk, the amount of disk usage as well. It's a nice, like, uh, snapshot, nice, like a, like a dashboard. It's a real, real nice looking, you know, when you pop into it. The scales, I think, are better. Like the like, so you can actually see your processor how they interleviate or you know put the different processor um, cores on top of each other, different colors. I like that a lot better. A lot of different little things, a lot of, a lot of visual tweaks. 
Even the uh, the close button, I think, is an enhancement. It's red now all the time, as opposed to being white and then going, you know, then turning red when you hover over it. But it's, it's red, so it's kind of like you know not to push that, that stop button. Very nice. Uh, so, Nate, have you used Stacer before as like a system monitoring tool? Have no, I have not. Give that a check and give that a compare. It's a system monitoring tool, but it's got like some built-in cleanup utility stuff. It's kind of like uh, was it bleach a bit kind of deal. Give that a look and compare that to uh, KSIS Guard or whatever the new system monitor tool is called now. You'll find that there's some very interesting similarities. Let's just put it that way. Well, Matt, what new things have uh, been going on in your world? Of uh, open source and Linux goodness. Uh, open source and Linux goodness. I've actually been testing out a that wireless microphone set that I got sent to me a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Seems to be working all right in Linux thus far. I really haven't had much in the way of issues with it. Not sure how I feel about the quality of it, but that's more of a tweaking on my end that I might need to do. Um, you know, as Wendy knows, uh, microphones can be a fickle devices on any OS. <laughs> Yeah, indeed they yes. can more on that later yep and so these are dynamic mics these aren't the typical uh condenser mics so the the way they work and stuff is a lot different the the freedom to not have the wire in the way is really really nice i would put it on it's better than the wireless systems i've reviewed before but it's got its shortcomings too like i can't actually use the microphone mount i have so you have to hold it <laughs> uh, because Why, is it not a standard oh. microphone mount? It, it, I have the standard microphone mount for like the boom arm and all that stuff that I have, but it's because of them being wireless mics, they're a different size. Gotcha. So that's why. So I have to look at potentially changing that up, but overall eh, I'm, I'm still in the reviewing process of that. Uh, I got a lot of sound settings. I still got a tweak, be it in OBS and, other audio programs to see how that's actually doing. But overall, it's pretty good. Not, not bad. Is it worth a hundred bucks? I would say it's not bad. Still yeah. Busy. It's not bad for pricing. I've seen cheaper. I've seen far more expensive. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new app platform service, which is a solution to build modern cloud native apps. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point your GitHub repositories and let the App Platform do all the heavy lifting. It has support for Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, and Docker. DigitalOcean runs all of their App Platform on their own infrastructure, so your costs are significantly lower than with any other products. Plus, they built this new app platform on top of DigitalOcean Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path so you can take more control of your infrastructure setup. As a listener to DLN Extend podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 credit on top of DigitalOcean's new app platform. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. So speaking of reviewing things and wireless especially, let's talk about cell phones, specifically Linux-powered smartphones or ones that can be potentially Linux-powered. There is... Realistically, if we're looking at it, four options. I'm not counting a slash E or however they pronounce it because that that's more of an OS and a range of phones that are other manufacturers and stuff. These are Linux specific or able to run Linux, not um, some stripped down Android version. Well, <laughs> some of them do run. Uh, some <laughs> of them, to be fair, some of them still are running a stripped down Android Very version. true customized let me restructure how i was going to say that they are kind of all over the place uh so the first one up is the follow phone which is goes about 430 dollars. it's four gigs of ram and a 64 gig storage ubuntu touch sailfish os and volo os which is essentially and this is where wendy is correcting me and she is correct it is a customized 
Android yep. open source project ROM, yeah. This is probably the one that has the most stomachable um, price tag, if it's not the Pine Phone, <laughs> to be honest. And it has a little bit better um, spec relation. Um, I believe the, the processor is a MediaTek in it. I have no interest really in kind of the Android end of things on that. But honestly, from what I've like the spec and everything else that I saw, like the fact that they're making it so you can have Ubuntu Touch or Sailfish OS or even Vala OS if you want the Android stuff. That's pretty cool, especially at that only, f- I say only, but uh, that $430 price tag. I would call it mid-range. Yeah. In the scope of phones, I would call that a mid-range phone. And it has, overall, I'd say some pretty good to mid-range specs. If you have, what, four gigs of RAM, that's really good for a phone, to be honest. In the day-to-day stuff, I find that to be... You know, you're pretty good. You're pretty good on four gigs of RAM on a small device like that. Yeah, I, I find it perfectly serviceable, to, uh, you know, because one of my backup phones for a while was the uh, the Moto G6, which was four gigs and 64 gigs of storage. And Andro- uh, say what you want about Android, it was usable and it wasn't like an, oh, my God, this is terrible experience. Not the best, obviously. The higher end you go, obviously, you're going to get better performance and you know a bunch of other stuff. Depending. Depending yes. on the OS. <laughs> Depend- I, I have to caveat that with saying sometimes the price performance increase that you get isn't worth the upgrade. No, sometimes it is very much negligible as far as um, that, that upgrade. Sometimes it's like if you look at it like an i5 or certain Ryzen processors, and is it really, is that extra cost really worth the, the jump in the, pr- like sometimes the price tag? Sometimes, no. Sometimes, yes. It's an but, asymptotal total curve when, <laughs> when like your higher performance, you know, like you spend a lot, a lot more money for a little bit more performance. Mm-hmm. I like to, st- I like to right. kind of hang back into the sweet spot where I, you know, I don't have to stay on the uh, bleeding edge of technology. That's one phone. And, and the Vala phone is up for pre-order. It's an indie go go but here's the weird thing it's actually shipping novel idea weird weird i some of the other cool things i find out of, uh, that i find about this phone i think keeps it um squarely within a good buy is you still have the USB-C connectivity and you have the 3.5 millimeter jack for those of us who still use that and yes the courage I use port. mine almost every single night that port is amazing to have still on your device. Yeah, how, how dare you want to have a courage port because it takes courage to actually <laughs> have one nowadays, it seems like. <laughs> uh, right? With that, though... So, you say $430 is like a is a reasonable amount? I, you know, mid-range, mid-range, yes, range. I would call that mid-range. Yeah, so I, I haven't spent any uh-huh. more than $150 on a phone in the last, I don't know, probably six or seven years. Like, so to me, that's outside of my price range because I break things a lot and it's actually a, even, even with a case on, I'll still somehow break them. And so I, to me, I, I just can't have nice phones. I just, it's not, that would be a too nice of a phone for a guy like me. My husband is also extremely hard on phones as in his new phone will show up and I will tell him he's not allowed to touch it until the case and the glass screen protector show up. There is one week that he broke the glass screen protector on his phone. I want to say three or four <laughs> times. And one of those cases was he'd had his phone in his pocket and he leaned over and dropped it through the engine of a truck. So yes, I completely understand where you're coming from. We have that issue here okay. as well. So I'm not alone. No, the next phone is the reason we're saying it's mid range. <laughs> very oh, much, okay. the re- yes. very much the reason we say that because you up next we have the FX Tech Pro One and spec for spec, this is the best phone that is available. That with an unlock bootloader, you can get up to eight gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. And I believe it's a Snapdragon 835, maybe an 845. I don't remember the exact one that it's using. But it's a little bit older. The cool thing with this is the unlock bootloader uh, lineage. If you don't want straight Android, you can get straight Android if you want. Or they're working with Ubi ports on the Ubuntu Touch and getting that all straight to work. The nice thing with that, though, is slide out physical keyboard. It is a sleek looking phone. I really like the design of this device. And then in some ways, I really do miss that physical keyboard attached to the device. I wouldn't ever want to go back to T9 texting at all. My only concern with this style is what Nate mentioned because I'm in such a 
dusty environment. I say my husband is hard on phones, but really I am just as hard on devices. They'll be in my lap. And then I step out of the excursion, not realizing that it was there and drop it on the cement, you know, pretty good falls my devices take. So I worry about some of that day to day taking hard knocks that is definitely a part of my day-to-day life. So this is another device that spec-wise, I would love to play with one. I'd love to own one, but I don't know if this one in particular would be one that I bought because of being rough on things. Yeah, I mean, it is a it re- truly is a sleek looking phone. And I like how the, the actual, the, the glass tilts up to expose the keyboard. So it's not just, you know, flat. Yeah. It's, it's almost a little ergonomic, but everything in me screams, you would break that thing quickly. And, and so it <laughs> wouldn't be the phone for me because I'm not gentle enough on, on small things. I've got, you know, my, my sausage fingers would probably drop it or, or whatever. And I don't know if I'd get, be able to get my fingers on those keys. That's actually a pretty good size phone, isn't it? You could do. Yeah, yeah. Th- those keys look pretty good. But this phone looks every bit worth the price they're asking for it as far as everything that they've packed into it. <laughs> It it looks uh, yeah it definitely has some of the what I would call flagship features mm-hmm. fingerprint reader if that's something that you use ambient light which is really nice if you're using an application that makes your phone darker or whatever in order to accommodate for stuff going on keyboard's backlit I mean if you're gonna have a physical keyboard this dang thing better <laughs> be backlit and um, Matt on that processor side it is the 835 qualcomm snapdragon oh yeah yeah so it'll max out at eight gigs regardless either way this is where <laughs> this is why we said the volophone was mid-range price nate right sticker shock of eight hundred and ninety nine dollars for this phone yeah if you go with the most ram and right. most built in memory yeah, yeah because they also in fairness we didn't mention the the six gig 128 gig model because that one is only $60 cheaper. So you might as well Break get it up. more RAM and get more internal yeah. storage. Yeah. I mean, it, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I, I'm not one to say, oh, wow, that's, uh, you know, phone, whatever. But the fact that it has a keyboard and it has a nice screen, it has a lot of really nice features to it. And it's got the uh, uh, full HD plus, the AMOLED screen mm-hmm. and the cameras. I mean, I know camera megapixels doesn't mean anything to some people like you <clears throat> wendy but it does have <laughs> decent i would say cameras as far as the their their uh, resolution a lot, I mean, and that really... rear camera is a sony camera so i would i would think that it has pretty decent quality yeah and the us it's usb c and the other advantage of this one is it's still yeah like you were saying usb c with hdmi support right Heck yeah. yeah. There's a lot of lot of positives, a lot of pluses with this with this. And so I I mean, I understand the the, the price. And I'm sure it also makes phone calls and text messages too. You know, if you especially if you can do gaming like mobile gaming and such, which I'm not really big into. I mean, unless it's a Game Boy. Um that's about as new as I have right now. I mean, it looks like a really, you know, well designed machine. So I'd be interested in seeing how that how that um is it available now? I mean I'm I'm just curious. Well so no, pre-order. no not yet. So here here's the one thing. This is the second phone on this list that is not shipping currently. However, they have shipped a prior product back in, I believe, 2019, which was essentially the 6 gig, 128 gig model. There was a, the, this newer version is more of a refinement of the, the original one. Um, okay. So things like support for, you know, uh, Ubuntu touch and that kind of stuff that that's part of the whole campaign. Right. But that brings us to the one that most people can actually afford. That is close to the most usable. And that is the pine phone. I love the pine phone. I, 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 I love er- everything that they're doing. And, you know, this is a community focused. Here's the hardware you guys figure it out unlike certain other places that are not doing that nate what are some of the things because you recently were running uh open susa on your pine phone what's your take on the pine phone as we speak i'm running open susa on it like it has i bought the ubi ports edition last year i believe it was and i will say i'm very i'm I, i'm i realize it's, it's a project phone it is not this is not what i would call a prime time phone unless all you want to do is make phone calls and text message and telegram and stuff like that otherwise it's i would say it's not a prime prime time phone the usability of it is is quite good it's in many ways better than because i ran plasma mobile on on a nexus 5x a couple years back i would say it's better than that experience especially since it's running open source i can see that that you know beautiful geeko lizard you know staring at me on the wallpaper it really nice it's it's it feels like home but um it's a little bit slow as far as 
how the application startup time and so forth. As far as connecting like uh, to Wi-Fi or to you know the uh, cellular mobile, that all seems to work fine. Bluetooth seems to work fine. Even the uh, you know flicking on the the light, uh, the flashlight on the phone, that seems to work. Taking pictures seems to work. At least last I tried. And I, um, I enjoy the plasma environment. I, I just like how it looks. I think it, it scales well to the phone. It, it requires, there's still some things that need, need some improvement uh, there, as far as like dialogues that pop up, that those need some some refinement. The Telegram, the Telegram client looks great. It looks like the mobile client, but it's actually the desktop client that's being scaled. Um, that that actually works great. Um, I, in fact, I... Um, I sent you pictures of that. The um the, the the web browsing is is decent. It's not you know it's not a great web browsing experience. I mean it's it's okay. It, it's no wor- I would say isn't I would say the mobile web browsing experience is is not exactly great anyway. So that's you know that it's not a really good gauge there anyway to, to, to judge a phone. But there are some I'm gonna get into some of the cons. So there's some rough spots of the UI. Uh, one is the dialogues need to be cleaned up a little bit as far as like how their the word wrap is and and how wordy they are. Uh, they work, but they're just it just needs it's a little bit sloppy looking yet. Uh, Discover is a bit slow. I know that probably comes as a, a shocker to you that uh, Discover would have any any problems with it. It works. I, I can install and manage applications to include mm-hmm. Flatpak with it on uh, on the OpenSUSE Plasma Mobile uh, desktop, if you want to call that UI, whatever. But the downside is also I don't have a, I have to do updates in the terminal, the sudo zipper dump. There's not a, a good way to do updates as far as system updates on it because it is running tumbleweed. Uh, so I mean, that, that's that's kind of an, a small thing. That's an easy fix, really. When, I mean, I could fix that with a little script. But the um, but yeah, just it's some of the just little rough spots. If as soon as those little rough spots are cleared off, I mean, sure, I can't I can't install Android games. You know, I can't give it to my kids and say go Pokemon Go it up with it. And I can't do my banking apps as of yet. If if I could do banking apps with it. And the, some of the uh, UI bits were cleaned up, like as far as the keyboard doesn't go away sometimes. Like sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's just, that's a v- very irritating. Um, and that's really the, the stopping point, I would say, in using it is the keyboard usage. If, if it just had a go away button, like like some keyboards do, then it'd be fine. It'd be usable. But because that doesn't go away, uh, it, it's just not, that's not totally usable. But I can send text messages. I send, in fact, because I've, you know, no, no one else to text, I'll, I'll text me and uh, say, hello, from open source to tumbleweed on a phone, pine phone, and I'll I'll respond to myself, you know, like a like a good recluse. Mm-hmm. But it, it works as a phone. It actually works, and I know going into it, it was kind of a hobby, a toy, and I, I'm perfectly happy with spending the hundred fifty dollars I did on the toy to uh, to play with it. So uh, I continue to play with it on a pretty regular basis, and hopefully I can actually do some contribute in some way that benefits everybody with it. Yeah. So right now I have Ubi ports on the uh, or Ubuntu Touch, whatever you want to call it, on the the Pine Phone, and I'm running the the post market OS edition, whatever <laughs> whatever version you want to call it at this point. I've used Plasma Mobile. I've used pretty much all of them at this point. To me, the most complete version, and apparently Pine64 disagrees, is actually the UbiPorts, honestly. It just feels like the most feature complete as close to polished final product that you can have right now. That's just my take, of course. There are things with the Pine phone that if you don't understand that it's a developer phone, early ad- uh, adopters phone, a beta product, alpha product that for those of us who got some of the community editions like you get in the uh, Ubiports edition. Nate. If you don't go in understanding that though, and you're expecting a fully baked product, uh, you're going to be severely disappointed, I think. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say severely, but you'd be, I think you'd be a little bit sore uh, with it. I mean, I wouldn't buy it. Yeah, you're right. If you bought it thinking that you can make this your primary phone and you're a heavy phone user... Yeah, you, you probably would not be happy. I think, though, if you were a casual or you just, you're going from like a flip phone to something else, I don't think you would, you would care that much. I would consider this, in, in its current state, I would almost consider it a feature phone as opposed to a quote-unquote smartphone where, where it's currently sitting as far as where the OSs and stuff are for it. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And, and mine has a great feature. It runs open Uh not, not that it's an obsession or anything, but, yes, but it's... It so, <laughs> and it does run well. And I do take it with me, you know, just to, to see how uh, the how it can how well it does it like the cell signals. Yeah, and it's really hard for me to judge everything because I know what the product is. It's not trying to be something it's not. This is a phone for developers and other people to build software and applications against. That that Linux mobile experience is actually plausible. So we have you know uh, responsive design and stuff on apps and that kind of stuff. And I'm fine with that. 
I understand that. It was $200 and I knew what I was getting. And the fact that they're putting out a keyboard attachment at some point just makes it that much more uh, interesting to me. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a it's a project phone, and I I kind of understand that. So like like for me and you, this is kind of it's a fun toy. What, what's your take and view on like the Pied phone? Well, for one, I let you guys kind of take the reins on this one because you've both had firsthand experience with it, and I have not. So there was a lot of stuff that can come from you two insight just from being able to handle the device that. You know, I can't give. But from what I've seen from it, would I probably make this my everyday phone as it sits right now? Probably not. But overall, as far as hardware for the value, this is one of the neatest phones on the market. I find just because of the different ROMs that you can install in it, there are very privacy friendly on top of the price tag. And doesn't this still have USB-C charging port? Yes, it it does. See, there you go. I think... If you are buying a device that you want to play with and really just experience some of the different open source ROMs that are out there, this is a wonderful place to dip that toe into. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, that's, I think that's, a, that's a good point to say. It's de- definitely something you can dip your toes into and see how it works for you. And if you go into it with those expectations, as Matt said, I think, you'd be, I think you'll be pleasantly, I don't want to say surprised, I think you'll have fun. Speaking of uh, playing, though, um, there is one other player. These are all going to be personal opinions, too. Please do take note of this. <laughs> the The last player we're going to be talking about is the uh, Purism Librem Five. <sighs> I've heard of it. Is it is it a thing yet? <laughs> it's apparently a thing for some people. Mister Who's the Boss, I believe, was one of. He's a YouTuber specifically who reviews mobile phones that talked about the pine phone the librem 5 he had one of the librem 5s and uh i don't really want to say much more than that i'll let you know people go watch that video for his take on them uh to me in my opinion the librem 5 has been a train wreck as a product to watch to be fair this is nothing new with the company of purism and i know we would like to state right now we have nothing against most of the people or any of the people that work at purism it is all on the company things that are said they're going to ship at a certain time and then they don't for not just months but years where people still haven't gotten past products and then one of our community members one of our contributors here at destination linux if you watched the lug fest you will know all of his issues with just trying to get his labrum vibe i don't want to make this about just like purism let, let, let's talk about i mean you can't really separate the two but right it's it's hard to separate the two because if it's really hard to tell somebody hey this is a great way to play with open source when it's not even you're not even sure if they're actually going to receive the hardware i agree so these are just going to be some criticisms i have of the phone in and of itself the cpu a 28 nanometer processor there has been i believe two revisions of that particular processor now down to 14 nanometers for those that don't understand what that means that means better power efficiency Uh, being able to fit more in a smaller area and definitely yeah. Much better power efficiency. Definitely. And the spec on the screen is basically that of the Pine phone. It is essentially a, a stretched out 720p screen. It's three gigs of mem- three gigs of RAM. Three gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of storage. I have not been impressed by any of that because, and this is where the problem I have with the phone as a product, $799. Yes, let's just round it up and say 800 because we're we're close enough. Yeah, so you're really not getting a whole lot of hardware for your money, especially if you compare it to some of the other phones that we talked about previously. It's really expensive, and hardware-wise, there really isn't a whole lot here. They are at least three years behind with the current processor that they have decided to use. Is it 1,200 some odd days or something like that? I I read... (laughs) Uh, 1,200 and like 30 something day, 40 something days last I, last I saw. Since the initial campaign, that equals out to what? 365 days, almost four years. 
if we're strictly talking spec and everything else, though, this is a three-year-old phone asking $800 because they're privacy respecting, quote unquote. We have hardware switches. The $200 phone has all that. We didn't talk about that this is also the most expensive phone. And why is this the most expensive phone? Because they have a $2,000 version of it because it's assembled (laughs) in the USA. (laughs) Do you know certain portions of this phone still, you know, they they have the Learbrum 5 USA. And the Libra 5 USA is assembled and some parts are sourced from the US. I will give them credit. However, to call it to be to sell it as a secure supply chain and everything else, you're still getting parts like your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module from India. You're still getting and nothing against where it's coming from. But if you're going to say call your phone the USA version, shouldn't your crap come from the US? (laughs) Like. At the end, you know, their their phone casing, the shell still comes from China. There's so much that I can't even like my brain can't wrap around that price tag. That that price tag puts it in the same sphere as the Galaxy Fold 2. Yeah, it, it is a really, really and high look price. At the technology, hardware technology differences between the two. The the price, I, I believe the Fold 2 is what, 2500 if I remember correctly, something, something like that. That is absurd. So uh, if we're talking top tier phones out of all the ones we've looked at, I'm going to go with the FX Tech Pro 1 over a Librem 5. Absolutely. 100% with you there. Because it, it gives me all the, the perks of like Ubuntu Touch and an unlock bootloader and all the other stuff. Or if I'm really concerned about my privacy, totally, I'm going to get the Pine phone because oh yeah there's pins in the back where i can shut everything all the same things that the libra 5 currently offers in a cheaper product and to me you know this is going to sound like a negative kick on purism in in their their phone but just between all the delays and everything out it just it's not a good product I don't see the Librem 5 being a viable option because of all the things that we mentioned. A, spec-wise, it's not that great, especially when you're comparing it with the price. So if it was more along the lines of the FX phone, okay, I can see that higher price just because the specs that you're putting into that. Then we go from, okay, spec-wise, it's not great. Price-wise, It's extremely high. And then we come to the history of the company itself and knowing that uh, you may get it, you may not. If you decide you want to cancel your order, you have to wait until they ship it to you and then send it back. You don't get to cancel it while you're waiting for it to be shipped. Yeah, because they'll tell you that every order is to build. I'm I'm just saying what they will say. Just don't build mine. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) If you are... One of these that insist on, you can say what you want, bad, good about the phone, the company. If you're ones that insist on a strictly FOSS version of a phone because, you know, free open source, new free software foundation sponsored phone, this is the one for you. If you, if you are on that end of the spectrum because it's FSF approved, whatever to me, the way they have done this phone is exactly what Canonical used to get lambasted for all the time. They went out, what they what they do? They went out and made Fosh. They went out and did their own thing. What what did Pine64 do? Here's the hardware. We're going to work, we'll work with the community and we'll give certain develop, you know, a certain portion of these community additions to the fo- uh, to the projects. That That is working with the community. I didn't see a lot of that with, with Purism and the Libra 5 specifically. As far as Fosh is concerned, uh, they can keep it. What they should, I mean, look, looking at this, okay, it's, we can, it's one thing to like just kind of rag on them for not delivering. I got that. I don't disagree whatsoever. But I think what, what is unfortunate to me is there's, there's a lack of owning up to it right now. You know, maybe, maybe they, they could, I think there's still a chance for redemption in the whole thing. If they maybe like roll it back just a little bit and say, maybe work with some more other aspects of the community, but something to to ensure the whole thing doesn't go to waste you know, you know what i mean like it just seems like it seems such a shame for all, all these people to have invested money in it and then nothing come of it you know if if the designs are maybe open sourced like, I, don't, I don't know i haven't seen anything as far as the designs are concerned and it could be you know something more could be done the information isn't lost and, and so forth i i would really i'd really like to see that you know mm-hmm. maybe uh, maybe fosh or whatever it's called posh fosh uh, maybe it it could be good. I don't know. It, it it's unfortunate they, they didn't work with you know, like the KDE community 
and and build and, and invest into the plasma mobile space because now, now maybe if those efforts would have been you know a little more synergy between those efforts maybe there would be something now maybe uh, purism would have actually shipped a working phone with open source software on it i don't know i i, I can't say for sure but there but there seems like you know, the fragmentation i uh, i not to get into that argument but it seems like now is not the time to fragment on an open source phone now is the time to work together on something and i think there's been a lot of that you know the plasma mobile and the ubi ports community mm-hmm. they've been working together quite a bit on things and just so there there is some synergy there it's i'd like to see more of that you know that i think i think, I think it was a missed opportunity by by purism they could have worked with the community on that and they just didn't and that's kind of where i stand with like the Leo. As viewing it as a product, it's been perpetually delayed. You can talk about like the, the the batches of the phone and all the other stuff that the you know all you want. At the end of the day, does it work? Does it not? You sold it as oh well, we'll have a final date and a final product. It, you didn't. You haven't met that. It's four years later almost, and you still don't have a product. At the end of the day, you kind of gotta call a spade a spade. And like what you said, Nate. I think they very much had an opportunity. I mean, let's. I'm not gonna sneeze at the fact they raised what three million dollars on, on a crowdfunding. That's nothing to sneeze at. No, well, people want this, especially in our community. They want, and even more so, four years ago, PinePhone wasn't available really wanted a phone that they could throw open source software on and have something that was more privacy centered as opposed to either being a stuck in the Apple ecosystem or in the Android ecosystem where you know there's a whole bunch of data leaks. This is why I make the comparison to Canonical a lot because you know the, you can talk about, oh, well, certain things weren't ready. X wasn't available. So they went and made you know, lib handy and all the other stuff. Cool. If that's all it required to get stuff to work, whatever. Cool. Thank you for the contribution. But the thing I have the biggest issue with is that there's this weird mentality around purism and like the Libram five specifically that they talk about almost this ride or die mentality with, uh, with the company, as far as like their view on the phone. To me, it's very much a kind of a uh, thing though, that like, these people who would complain constantly about canonical doing like things like unity and you know all, all the other stuff for ubuntu but it's okay for purism to do it's all it's okay for them to make their their own os it's okay for them to do this with the phone and do they not see the contradiction in their logic right and i have nothing against purism creating their own os absolutely go for it but if this is supposed to be an open source style project, a privacy focused project, sharing this with existing projects that are already working towards mobile just seems like a great idea. Mm -hmm. Bring all of those minds together, bring together the people that are already in those projects that are seeing the issues that are having and working on them now. Create your own realm, but contribute to what's already going on i think these guys approached the overall situation wrong as far as when it comes specifically to the phone the phone was a new endeavor for the entire community and i think with purism jumping into it they could have taken existing products even like you know ubi ports or you know whatever base you want to use they could have used sailfish nemo uh uh, Luna OS. They could have used. There are so many options available that they could have used that they didn't go with their own way. And I think that's the disappointing piece right there is is that they they had they had such a great opportunity for for doing something great and really really helping out everybody, and they chose not to. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden, the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords and other vital, sensitive information. It is not only open source, but has also had third-party auditing on the source code. This is why I've chosen Bitwarden for my password manager. It's easy to get started. Just go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. The big question is, why do I need a password manager? And that's a good one. Why do you? Well, I'll tell you. Using password123 on all your accounts is just not a good security practice. Also, having the same password for everything is a terrible idea. Remembering all the variations is nearly impossible unless you have some kind of a super memory. And a super memory is something I do not have. And storing passwords on sticky notes or in a spiral bound notebook is not only inconvenient, it also is a bit lacking in security efficacy. Therefore, I have chosen Bitwarden. This is a password book that I can take with me anywhere. I can have it on different computers, different browsers, 
on my mobile. Not only is it a safe place for passwords, but also identity and financial account information as well. This feature got me out of a pretty serious jam recently when I had an issue with some safety controls on one of my accounts. I needed to use another card to pay for the rest of the service. Since I didn't take that card with me anywhere, I didn't have it on me, but I did store the information on Bitwarden. I remembered I did this, so I pulled up that account information, paid for the service, and ultimately prevented what could have been a serious life interruption. You can get started with Bitwarden by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. It's free to use, but if you want to level up and go for the premium features for only $10 a year, not only will you support a great open source project, but also you will unlock premium password security and management features. Bitwarden has saved my bacon numerous times. Now, you wouldn't be able to pry it out of my cold, dead device. We'd like to thank Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. And speaking of hardware choices, uh, Nate, you have a interesting piece of new hardware that you chose to use or get a hold of, I should say. Yeah, so this is kind of one of those um, impulse buys. I, I was I went to help a, a friend out um, and he had some computer issues and it seems like I'm the guy, I guess. So I um, I went to his house okay. and I was helping him install some some uh, some CAD software in, in Windows 10, which by the way, man, I love Linux. But helping him install some, some software. And um, the uh, he had this fan go and plugged into his computer that was a USB fan, just powered right off the computer USB or you can anything really USB that is, you know, rigid and can support some sort of, you know, some weight. And it was the neatest, it's the neatest little fan. It has LEDs in it. And as the fan spins around, it's in one of the blades, it, it pulses the blade, the, the lights on to, to generate an image of a clock, like an, an ag- analog clock. And also with it, with the current temperature, like what the temperature is around you. And so it's, it's such a neat device because it, uh, you know, it, because basically the, the refresh rate on your eyes isn't that high. So the, your, your brain interprets that those spinning lights as a, as an image, like a, you know, like a, the, a screen would, you know, like, like you'd see on your screen. And it's a, uh, the second hand is animated. Everything is animated on it. The, uh, the temperature kind of spins. And it spins from Celsius to Fahrenheit, like so you can see both both temperatures immediately. It's it's a silly thing, but um, it's nice to have air movement, especially if I'm like working in my super cubicle here. So it'd be nice to like just to plug that in and have that just kind of blowing a little air on me, just you know when you're sitting, and uh, and then be able to see what time it is. I mean, not that I need another clock, but I love clocks. They're just I just do. I love clocks. It's a silly thing. It was fifteen dollars. I got it on online, and uh, I think unique people. <laughs> Should should buy it. Well, Nate, you know you do have very unhealthy obsessions. So yeah, you know, what's what's one more to you know add? This is this is a good point. I, I think I do. I, wait, no, hold, un, almost almost unhealthy <laughs> obsessions. Catch you to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it's on record, and I'm so keeping that in. <laughs> the first slip ever. I, I, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you have some other game or something you want to try and, uh, promote to enable the community. Uh, so the, actually, yes, uh, me have a game never always more like it. Uh, this is actually a quote unquote triple A game that you can play on Linux. Yes, it is technically currently rated gold, but take that for what you will. For me, I'm just saying my experience, it is very much enable proton, click play, and it works. So that's what it is. But this game is uh, Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain. Rated M, so this is not a kid's game. Um, stealth and all that fun stuff. Uh, open world stealth game. Uh, a lot of different kind of upgrade paths to, to weapons and that kind of stuff. Really, really pretty game too, not going to lie. This is done by Hideo Kojima. So anyway, who is a gamer and knows who Kojima is, expect a bonkers storyline, as always. <laughs> Want another one? Go play Death Stranding. <laughs> I like the open world aspect of it. You can get really crazy inventive with some of the stuff. They they have uh, like a balloon. Like you can tether balloons to certain vehicles or people and stuff and have them get yanked up into the sky and they become like recruits. But as they're going up in the sky, you can you can shoot the balloons that they're attached to, so they fall from the sky. <laughs> oh wow! So it, it's just funny stuff like that, or like you can attach like I think it's two or three that it takes to like lift a tank 
watch it go up in the sky, shoot all the balloons and watch it drop onto a guy or something. And like, there's just funny stuff you can do with the environments in this game. And that's why I really like it because it encourages you to be creative. It's not just a, uh, like a run and gun kind of game, kind of more, you know, it's just a more slow paced game, but that's really why I like it. So Wendy, what has been on your interest plate? I went ahead and finished that audacity class last week, and I highly recommend this class to anybody who is interested in learning audacity. This one is specifically for podcast editing. So he doesn't go into a lot of the other tools when it comes to different sounds and stuff that you can add. It's more trying to eliminate different sounds and getting loudness normalized in different ways that you can tweak or fix audio specifically for podcasts. But I, I do, I highly recommend this class. It is a great one. And I was happy overall with the way episode 48, yes, I was very happy with the way episode 48 came out, except for there were still some sound issues on my end. And in messing with that, I realized that it was not the post processing. Of course, you know, there was definitely some things that needed fixed or learned from 47. But in 48, there were some issues that I'm having that I was realizing it wasn't something that I was doing post-processing that was going wrong. The issue itself was with the mic. And I know somebody mentioned on the discourse forums, I'd have to look to see who it was, but somebody had mentioned before that I was peaking, right? That there was some issues with my audio. And at that time, it was Hardware Addicts that he was referencing specifically at a timestamp. And this is not cases where the issue is happening in post-production. If you are looking at the WAV files, you don't see anything wrong, especially when my raw files come in. In Audacity, you can turn on a feature to where you can see exactly where your sound is peaking, where you're going so high that it's cutting things off. And in the WAV file, none of that is happening. So I determined that it is all within the mic. It's the mic itself that is getting peaked. It's getting too high. The sound is getting too harsh. So if I'm within a certain distance, my voice sounds really good. It's clear. There's no crackling. There's no distortion. But having a normal conversation as you do with people, sometimes you get louder or whatever. Your voice fluctuates with emotion or interest. And in those times, my mic would be getting overmodulated. And that is what some of that distortion is that's been happening within both of these different podcasts. So there is a new mic coming. It, next episode, I'll be using that mic and seeing if I still have some of the same issues with that mic as I do with this one. I really, really don't want to drop a whole lot of money on a mic upgrade. But if I do, I guess I do because it drives me nuts. Probably just like it drives all of you nuts to hear that distortion when the mic is being peaked, when the mic is being overmodulated. Well, I guess we'll uh, find out and to see how well you sound on the next episode then. if you So that means a lot more uh, tweaking of the audio settings, I'm assuming, because new mic and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I really didn't do too much on this one, but I do have my XLR mic going directly into a USB interface. I'll leave a link in the description for the one that I am currently using. And it seems to be doing pretty good. So I don't know that there will be too much tweaking, but I'll definitely be playing with it. Um, the first show, actually, that you'll hear me with it will be the next episode of Hardware X. I will have it for that show. So if you want to know how the first test run with that mic goes, the next episode of Hardware Addicts, I'll be using the new mic. We'd like to continue the discussion with you on Telegram, in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for more information on how to connect to the social channels and all our shows and creators at DestinationLinux.network. For more information on where to find us, you can find more information uh, for me at CubicleNate.com. Links to my regular written blatherings, podcast, and YouTube channel can be found there. You can find my random ramblings on Twitter at MattDLN. You can find me on Mastodon at WendyDLN at Mastodon.online. Be sure to check out the DLN merch store. Go grab yourself some awesome DLN Extend swag along with other shows from across the network. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another fantastic episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone.